Well, hello everyone. This is Dr. Paul Rose, and in this presentation, I'm going to talk to you about the dissection of a female barn owl. And I'm going to go over a post mortem that I did with my own students with a clearer recording so you can see the process and you can see what happens. This female barn owl was sadly hit by a car, and therefore she was provided to me by one of my friends who found her on the side of the road. She was wearing a metal closed ring, which has been reported to the BTO, so they are aware of the cause of death of the animal and her records can be going into their database. Whenever we do a post-mortem on a wild animal, we make sure dander, dust, bits of fur or feathers cannot be aerosols and breathed in. That's why I just wiped her over with that bacterial and antiviral hand wipe. I'm trying to preserve the structure of the feathers on this owl because they have some amazing adaptations for silent flight. If I was doing this more formally, I would damp the bird down with a disinfectant to make sure that there was no chance of any aerosol components occurring. As I'm doing this by myself at home and there's nobody else present, I've just wiped over her feathers. I should also say that if I was doing this in the laboratory, I would of course be wearing laboratory gloves. But again, I've done this at home. The bird has been in the freezer and therefore the chances of any nastiness being on her feathers and integument is very slim. You're all aware that owls are silent flyers. And the reason they can fly silently is because of the structure of their feathers. The owl is a flighted bird and therefore her feathers grow in tracts across her body. There are some areas of her skin that will be devoid of feathers because of how the bird's feathers grow in particular areas. And here I'm showing you the front of the bird and you can see the large disc around her eyes which channels light into the eye and channels sound into the owl's ears which sits at opposite sides of her head at different angles. That's to allow the owl to judge distance as to where the sound comes from. You can also see that the bird's face is quite distorted and that's classic symptoms of a collision with a car and a road traffic accident. Whenever we have a cadaver that we're going to do a post-mortem investigation on, we always check the integument of the animal to make sure it looks normal. And we also always check fur and feathers to make sure that everything would appear to be normal in how the animal is maintaining itself. Is it preening or grooming itself properly? We would also move the legs and any other joints that we can move to check for normal movements. So before we start doing any cutting, we must make sure we are aware of all areas that are movable on the body could be moving normally and therefore if they're not give us an idea of health and disease and potential causes of death. So you can see the bird's wing moves normally on that side but on this side the wing hangs loosely. Classic symptom of a bird that has flown into something or has been hit by a car. So this bird sustained a broken wing at the time of death. The wing on the one side of the animal is floppy and loose and is not held tightly against the body. We can also see that the bird has a broken leg. One leg is loose, it's got a fracture and it's not being held in a normal position. Compare that to the stiffness of the other leg, which has its bones intact and its normal musculature holding it in place. 
Here are the details that my friend provided me when he found this barn owl. It's a female, and I'll come to the reasons why it's a female in a moment. It was found in Norfolk in January, and the month that the owl was found and the season that the owl was found is important for some of our investigations in this post-mortem later on. If this was a captive bird of prey, we would be interested in the integrity of the bird's foot. And I'll explain why that's important later on. And here you can see on the leg, the closed metal ring with the records on it that were provided to the BTO to tell them that a ringed bird had been recovered dead. And this is important for demographic and life history studies that give us an idea of population densities, how many individuals of what sex are around, and how long animals are living for. Now, I mentioned that she is a female barn owl, and we can tell this because her breast is nice and clean and white. If it was a male barn owl, it would be more streaked and patterned. You can see very nicely the anatomy of the bird's wing which is comparable to your hand. Your fingers are where the attachments for the bird's long flight feathers would be, and your thumb, otherwise known as the bastard wing on a bird, is that small part of the wing that was sticking out when I was holding it. So here are the attachments for the flight feathers, and the alula, or bastard wing, is that first part of the wing that is sticking out just by the flight feathers. Birds have several different types of feathers over their body. Contour feathers are the main body feathers. Primary and secondary and tertiary wing feathers and tertial feathers are those that we see on the wings and wing coverts are those that overlay the wing feathers. Underneath these contour feathers, which are waterproofed, we find down, phyloplumes and semiplumes, which help with insulation and preening behaviours. Barn owls are a predator. They have extremely sharp claws on their feet, and these talons are what they use to dispatch their prey. This is the killing apparatus of the bird. The beak is simply used for tearing the prey apart for ease of swallowing. It's the talons themselves that do the dispatching of prey. You can see the integrity of this bird's foot is excellent. There are no bumps or lumps or abrasions, or any form of cuts or openings to the external environment. If this was a captive bird, we would always check the integrity of the feet, the plantar aspect of the feet, to make sure there was no sign of pododermatitis or bumblefoot which is caused by pressure points of the bird standing on the same area of perching that is not exercising the base of the feet. You can always tell how a bird earns its living by looking at its beak and feet. How does it go about catching and dispatching its prey or collecting its food? And then we can look at its wing anatomy to work out its life history, its behavioral ecology in that particular habitat that gets it from A to B to work out how it, how it goes about foraging. So in the case of the owl with this large face, with these big eyes, which give you a clue as to when it hunts, owls with darker eyes are those that are nocturnal. Owls with lighter yellow eyes are more likely to be diurnal. And then the sharp talons, which are the bird's tools for catching its prey, allow it to pounce silently onto its prey, and therefore, that's the reason why owls are such successful predators. Bumblefoot is a common environmental disease in captive birds of prey. You must make sure that perches are of different widths so that they are able to exercise the underneath of the foot. And you must make sure that your birds can fly regularly to ensure they get enough exercise for a good blood supply to continue around all areas of their extremities. This increases white blood cell counts to the extremities, 
and therefore can release any toxins or build up of pathogens because of cuts and abrasions and help the foot heal more quickly. We would always check any external openings on the body when we do a post-mortem. In the case of this barn owl, her bill is damaged because of the impact of hitting a car, so it's hard for me to open the bill. But we would open the bill, we would check the nostrils or nares, which are slits on the side of the bill, because that's often a site for parasites to be found. We would make sure there's no blocking inside of the mouth. We would check the cloaca, which is where birds produce their waste from, and we would check the bird's preen gland, which is found at the base of the bird's tail. All of these areas can be sites for parasites, lumps and bumps, or other signs of disease and abnormality, which is always checked on our external view of the body before we start cutting. And here I'm explaining where the cloaca would be found, as well as how we would check the bird's body condition by parting her feathers and seeing how well muscled she is around her sternum. Remember I said earlier that feathers on a bird grow in traps. There are bare patches of skin on the body. The body is not completely feathered all over. We press the muscle along the side of the sternum, the keel of a flighted bird, which projects out from the breast and the muscle attaches onto that keel. And that's how we deduce body condition. We're not so much interested in the point along the breast, we're interested in how muscled, how well rounded the muscle is. You can see I'm doing that with my hands. So by seeing how well muscled the breast uh, muscle is around the keel of the sternum, we get a good idea of body condition. Now I said to you that this bird was found in January, in midwinter. She was in excellent condition because her breast muscle is well rounded. Therefore, we can get an idea that she's an adult, relatively experienced, and therefore able to feed herself well in a difficult time of year. Now let's look at the animal's adaptations for silent flight. You can see the barn owl is beautifully patterned, which helps it with camouflage. But you can also see how she's counter shaded with different colours of dark on top and light underneath, again to break up her outline and to make sure she is able to remain inconspicuous from prey. You can see how the disc around her face allows her to not only channel light into her eyes, but as I said earlier, sound into her ears. An owl's ears allow for the judging of distance based on where their prey is in relation to their perch. Barn owls are incredibly soft feathered. Like most owls, these soft feathers allow them to fly silently because the softness of their feathers and the feather structure itself disrupts how the air flows over the body and therefore means they don't create excess noise and turbulence when they fly. And here you can see the owl's brood patch on her chest, which would be an area of poor feathering or incomplete feathering, which she would sit, which she would, she would use when sitting on her eggs. She would press that skin, that bare skin, against her eggs to transfer heat. Now let's look at the structures of the owl's feathers for silent flight. Hopefully you can see the filaments along the edge of the owl's feathers are not smooth. They look like tiny hair-like projections, and these tiny projections disrupt the air currents as the bird flies, which means there's no sudden movement of air downwards or upwards, which would create noise. The air flows over the wing in circles, and this means that the owl can fly silently by changing the patterning of the air. She doesn't create excess noise, which prey can hear. A BBC documentary from 2015 recorded the change to air pressure caused by a pigeon flapping over a bed of feathers, a peregrine falcon flapping over the same bed of feathers, 
and of a barn owl. And you can see the owl causes little to no disturbance to this bed of feathers because of its adaptations. So it's these edges to the wing feathers particularly, which hopefully you can see, don't look smooth, but look kind of ruffled, that allow the owl the ability to flap without making any noise. The same documentary also recorded the sound produced by the flapping flight of the pigeon flying over extremely sensitive microphones. Again, the falcon is recorded flapping flight over these highly sensitive microphones and you can see the peaks and troughs of sound produced. But when we get to the barn owl, once again, there's very little disturbance to the air and therefore the flight is silent. So I'm now going to prepare the body for fir the first incision that I would make. We always make sure that we place the bird on their back with their abdomen facing upwards. And we always cut along the midline, starting at the larynx or syrinx in a bird in the throat, going all the way down the center of the thoracic cavity and the abdomen down to the cloaca or vent or anus if it was a mammal. And we damp down the feathers on the bird's chest to make sure that there's no aerosol of any particles on the anim animal that we could otherwise breathe in. So here I am just wiping over the feathers to make them damp, again with an antibacterial and antiviral wipe. This allows me to cut into the body without being impeded by feathers and it's also good practice for health and safety too. Birds have very thin skin. It's important to not dig deeply into the skin when you do your first incision because you don't want to damage any underlying organs or disrupt the integrity of any organ systems or tissues that might give you a clue to the animal's cause of death. Again, you can see the brood patch on the bird where the feathers are bare from the skin, which would be used when the animal is brooding youngsters and eggs. Pull the skin up with forceps if you can and drag the scalpel along the body away from you, cutting very gently just into the skin and avoiding any deeper incision, incisions into the muscles underneath. So I'm starting at the syrinx in the throat and I'm going down the midline of the body, removing feathers as I go, being very careful to only cut through the bird's skin. I will lift up and move away the feathers so I can get an unimpeded cutting edge and I don't unnecessarily blunt my scalpel blade. And I will follow the same incision to make sure I do as minimal damage as possible to the body, pulling up the skin with forceps to allow me to cut into the body more easily. And you follow your line of incision all the way along the midline, all the way down to the cloaca, and then you would cut underneath the skin as you pull it up to gradually take the skin away, deglove the skin from the body, allowing you to see the underlying muscles and underneath the muscles, the underlying organ systems. You should move the cadaver around or move around the cadaver yourself to make the incision easier. Always have a free and unrestricted working area when you do a post-mortem. And here you can see the breast muscle of the owl, the sternum, the keel of the sternum, the prominence, the bony prominence is in the middle. And this dark colored uh, breast muscle is indicative of a healthy animal. She's extremely well muscled. So she was obviously looking after herself and being able to meet environmental challenges at the time of her death. I'm now cutting away from the muscle. So I'm removing more of the skin along the sides of the body. You can again see how thin the bird's skin is. 
and you will note how little fat there is underneath the bird's skin, between the skin and the muscle. Wild animals carry very little fat. That's why birds particularly can succumb so easily to cold related energy deficits during inclement weather. So for your garden birds, like your green finches and house sparrows and blue tits, do provide them with supplementary feeding in the autumn and winter. Because you can see from this top predator, an animal at the top of the food chain, she is carrying very little fat and is relying on her foraging abilities to keep her alive at a very harsh and inhospitable time of year. Always be very gentle with your scalpel blade. Resist the urge to pull and tug on the skin. You will rip and damage areas of the body that may provide you with diagnosis information to give you an idea of cause of death. Obviously, in this case, the cause of death is really obvious. But in other cases, perhaps of disease or pathology, we're not entirely certain of the cause of death until we open up the animal. And here you can see a lovely clean incision with the tissues underneath completely intact and ready for me to explore in more detail. If an animal has been frozen, be aware of post-mortem change. Things that have changed in the body after death because of how the cadaver has been preserved. For example, a bit of skin here that is still attached to the breastbone because of freezer burn. That's not a symptom of what killed the animal, it's post-mortem change. And we must always remember this when we dissect a frozen body. Pathologists doing this in industry try to use fresh or refrigerated specimens and avoid frozen carcasses because you can only do gross pathology. Some of the symptoms might be damaged by the freezing process and you can't do histopathology i.e. taking histological, teeny tiny tissue samples to grow for bacterial or viral cultures or fungal cultures from a frozen specimen. The two sides of the breastbone, the two sides of breast muscle around the breastbone are visible there, which gives you an idea of the health of the animal when she was alive. So here you can see the two sections of the breast muscle that sit around the central keel, the prominence of the, ster of the sternum. You can see the lack of fat underneath the skin, between the muscle and the skin, and you can see how the feathers grow out of the skin in particular tracts. You can also see how underneath all of that feathering and down, the owl is actually a relatively small bird. It is the general fluffiness, if you like, of their feathers that make them look so large. And in some species such as the great grey owl, they're actually a relatively petite skeleton with a lot of fluffy feathers attached. I'm now going to cut into the breast muscle, the pectoral muscle of the bird. So you can see how healthy the muscle tissue is underneath. Birds have a superficial, a top layer of breast muscle and a deeper layer of breast muscle underneath. This top layer that sits on top of the deeper layer should be cut through so you can see the deeper layer of muscle underneath. Imagine like a chicken breast where you have the outer layer of the chicken breast and then a thinner layer of muscle almost wrapped inside. If this was a captive animal that had died shortly after transportation, for example, you would check the integrity of this deeper layer of muscle to make sure if the animal had overly exerted itself that it hadn't succumbed to something called capture myopathy, which can occur when this deeper layer of the breast muscle becomes overexerted and expands. So because of the restriction of the overlying surface layer of breast muscle, this expansion of the interior layer of breast muscle causes it to die off because of a lack of blood supply and therefore turn toxic in the body. And this sudden death after 
uh, exercise because of something like the stress of capture and handling is called capture myopathy because an otherwise healthy animal suddenly succumbs. So by looking at the integrity of the internal breast muscle of a bird, you get an idea as to whether or not capture myopathy has occurred. And here you can see all of the muscle tissue throughout the breast muscle of that owl is perfectly healthy. It's a nice mahogany colour. It's got an excellent blood supply. There's no change to its integrity. There's no change to its structure. And therefore, the bird has, has no signs of overexertion, which is what you would expect in a wild animal that is exercising on a daily basis. I'm now going to remove the breast muscle and I'm going to cut through the ribs of a bird so I can take out the muscle and the sternum to see into the thoracic and abdominal cavity underneath. Flighted birds, such as owls, have pneumatic bones. Their bones are hollow and contain struts that hold them up. This is an evolutionary adaptation for flight because it means the body is lighter overall and therefore there is energy saving when the bird flies along. These pneumatic bones are relatively easy to cut through with your scalpel or with a pair of scissors. Just be very delicate when you do this so you don't do any ripping or tearing of underlying tissues. Because one of the things that we want to preserve in a relatively fresh specimen when it's uh, been found after death and hasn't been allowed to decay, so in the case of this owl, this is a relatively fresh specimen, one of the things that we want to preserve to try and look at are the bird's air sacs, which are extensions of the respiratory tract that allow for efficient gas exchange when the animal is flying. Think about how much skin you need to remove when you wish to start cutting away sections of the skeleton to see the organs underneath. Don't be afraid of removing more of the skin from the body to give yourself a larger working area when you need to start examining the organs in more detail. So here I'm going to use my surgical scissors to cut through the bird's ribs, to lift up the sternum so I can get to the organs underneath. And here what we can see is actually the proventriculus or glandular stomach of the bird. And what you might be able to see poking out of that proventriculus is a mouse. So here is the owl's dinner as she was hunting. We have got that preserved beautifully inside her proventriculus, her glandular stomach that allows for enzymic and acidic breakdown as food. The fact that this mouse is still relatively intact and hasn't been digested suggests we can piece together more of the reasons why this owl was hit by a car. And if we then look more closely into the proventriculus, we end up pulling out three mice in total. So the proventriculus will expand to allow the owl to take in more of its prey as it catches it. Owls do not have a crop. The saculation of the esophagus that allows them to store food. An owl's food goes straight down its esophagus into its proventriculus and then into its gizzard, which is the muscular stomach. And it's the gizzard that is involved in producing the owl pellet, which then moves back into the proventriculus to be coughed up and regurgitated. A sign that an owl is ready to feed again is when a pellet has been produced, because the act of producing a pellet blocks the owl's digestive tract. So it can't swallow any more food whilst it's trying to get rid of an existing pellet. So this bird was obviously an extremely effective and efficient hunter. And the reason that I'm suggesting this might give us an idea of its cause of death is roadside verges are excellent habitat for small rodents. So this owl was probably out hunting 
along a roadside verge which caused it to be hit by a car. And you can see here the size of the proventriculus to accommodate all of those mice. As the owl continues digestion, the mice would travel from the proventriculus into the ventriculus or gizzard, the muscular stomach, which is where mechanical breakdown aided by acid and enzymes and mucus from the proventriculus would enable the owl to start digesting its prey. The owl's pellet, which is regurgitated, would be made up of fur, bone and other indigestible elements of the body of its prey. I'm continuing to cut through the ribs now to go back to removing the sternum so we can see the associated organs, liver, heart, lungs, that would be underneath. And here I have been able to preserve some of the air sacs underneath the sternum which allow for this efficient respiration. You can just about see one of the air sacs glistening in the corner of that picture. Bird lungs are rigid. They don't expand and contract, get bigger and smaller with each breath like the mammalian lung does. So the air sacs act as bellows, holding air and pushing it through this relatively rigid lung. All flighted birds have nine air sacs. There are two cervical air sacs. There are two in the clavicle. There are two in the cranial section of the thorax, and there are two in the caudal section of the thorax, and there are two abdominal air sacs too. And some of these air sacs extend into bone, thus giving more space for the bird to be able to transport air around effectively so it can breathe and continue gaseous exchange whilst it's flying. And if we look a bit more closely into the thoracic cavity, we can see the glistening of one of the air sacs. And I have some photos of this so you can see in more detail, which I have included in the presentation. Unlike in mammals, inspiration and expiration in birds is an active process which requires muscular activity. Therefore, these air sacs are really important to keep this active and efficient gaseous exchange occurring during flight. And here you can see again on the wing, the structure of the wing. If my fingers are where the primaries would be attached, my thumb, which is the allula or the bastard wing on the bird, you can see how the anatomy of the human hand is very similar to the bones that we see in the bird wing. So I'm now proceeding to continue with cutting through the ribs. You can see the heart there and underneath the liver. The bird's heart is relatively large. It has to be efficient to pump blood around the body whilst the bird is flying. And in some cases, dealing with very high altitudes with poor oxygen saturation. In a female bird, the liver is relatively large because it helps with yolk production when she's laying eggs. And here you can see the position of the heart in the bird's thoracic cavity. If this was a mammal, the diaphragm would be separating the thoracic cavity from the abdomen. But birds do not have a diagram because air is moved in and out of the respiratory system because of these changes in pressure 
in the air sacs. Because of how air sacs go into bone and in the abdominal cavity as well, any infections that are occurring in the respiratory tract can spread into other sections of the body very quickly. So here is the heart with a bit of pericardial fat attached. That's fat that is protective of the heart, keeps it from being damaged by any knocks that occur to the animal. Sadly, not in this case with a road traffic accident, of course. And there you can see the structure of the sternum and how the breast muscle is attached to that pointy top and underneath is very flat and smooth. And I'm pointing out now on the bird's thorax, and I'm pointing out now on the bird's trachea, a syrinx, which is where she would make her sounds from. Equivalent to the mammalian larynx, the syrinx is part of the upper respiratory tracts that many birds use to make their sounds. And again, it's a site of infection. For example, aspergillosis can grow on the syrinx and cause a physical blockage of the base of the trachea, which means the bird can suffocate. To always check for any wheezing or unusual sounds in a captive bird, which might be a symptom of a fungal growth caused by aspergillosis fumigatus. An aspergillus fumigatus is an environmental pathogen, but many birds that come from clean environments, i.e. penguins from Antarctica, or tree-dwelling birds, such as this owl, which is not going to spend a lot of time on the ground, can be very susceptible to polluted environments in captivity, where they're exposed to high levels of environmental fungal pathogens. You can see the large amount of bleeding within the body here, which is most likely caused by internal organ damage after the animal was hit by a car. And this is a type of problem with doing gross pathology because this can mask some of the signs of disease or some of the signs of other organs that you're trying to look for if there has been traumatic change to the organs, which means they can be hard to identify. So I've now dissected out the gizzard and the proventriculus, and I'm now looking at the underlying intestines, and I'm going to try and find the owl's oviduct so we can see how reproductively active she is. Because this owl was found in winter, it's going to be more tricky to work out where the oviduct and ovary is. Because outside of the breeding season, the reproductive tracts of birds atrophy, they shrink, and into the breeding season, they hypertrophy and grow. This is a weight saving evolutionary trait that means the bird can save energy during flight at times of the year when the reproductive tract is not needed. In the majority of birds, only the left ovary and oviduct are functional. And therefore, if this left hand side gets damaged, we might see changes to what the bird's appearance is. It might start producing male hormones, such as testosterone, reducing the levels of estrogen in the body, and female birds can sometimes grow male type feathers and plumage characteristics. This is particularly common as female birds age and their reproductive system becomes less effective. The oviduct will sit in the abdomen, around the intestines, the kidney will be attached and there will be an attachment of the oviduct to the cloaca this single exit point for both faeces and urates and the egg when she lays and the sperm for a male bird. So here where I'm currently pointing at the moment is the functional ovary and oviduct of this bird, but it's incredibly small because in the winter time, she is not reproductively active. 
I hope you have enjoyed this dissection of a barn owl to show you some of its key features. We've talked about the advantages it has of its silent flight to the anatomy and structure of its feathers. We've talked about the changes to the reproductive tract in and out of the breeding season. We've explained the bird's key features of its respiratory tract to allow it to be efficient in flight. And we've looked at some of the key signs and symptoms of a road traffic accident in a wildlife casualty. We've considered how to do a basic post-mortem, a gross pathological investigation on a, spe a specimen of wild animal that was found dead. Please make sure that if you do this at home, you have all of the right equipment, you wash your hands thoroughly, you make sure you dispose of the carcass appropriately, and you make sure that everything is sterilized and fully cleaned and you do not touch your face or mouth at any point, or you do not eat or drink during a post-mortem. It's essential that you remove any chances of disease getting from the body to any other animals or other people, and you thoroughly sanitize all tools, equipment and surfaces after the post-mortem has occurred. Thank you very much.